Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development. This is our Educators Podcast. I'm delighted to have with us Brenda Williamson, Dr. Brenda Williamson, who is the head of the Canadian International School System in Vietnam. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Delighted to speak to you, an ex-Indonesian educational leader as well, such as myself. Yes. Tell us about your role that you have right now, and I know you arrived there just as things were locking down. So why don't you share with us what you expected and what it's become? Sure. So I'm the head of school for the Canadian International School System here in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Um, Right now, about 1,880 students across uh, two of our schools. Those are the two schools that I'm the head of. Uh, Those are international schools. We also have three other schools in the system that are uh, local-based schools, uh, more public schools, so than than private. Um, So I I came here expecting to work with uh, the, the, the board of directors, which is a proprietary board. So in private schools, of course, we have proprietary boards, and then you have uh, boards that are led by representation from your community. So proprietary board, our board makes a profit. This is how they make a living. Um, and so I come here to help them to align themselves, first of all, to align themselves to some international standards. So I was hired to uh, help them move from uh, uh, the system they currently have to a more international standard system. So I bring my background of international schools uh and the accreditation process and i bring also the understanding of some of our asian culture um from a variety of nations and and of course when you have an international school system in asia you have a variety of asian people groups um so so bringing that in helping people to understand what each of those groups how they value and see education Um, and then of course you know, how do we help our, our system to not only grow, but to grow well in its reputation um, and to grow well in its ability to, um, to meet the needs for students and parents. Um, and, and our board hopes to do that through some international accreditation work. And so that's really my main focus and goal here uh, at this time coming in as, as the head of school. So I've recently been um, leading with a larger school group here who went through the WASC accreditation. Is that the one you're going through or is there a different one you're going to be pursuing? No, as you know, there are several. WASC is out of the U.S. There's five different ones out of the U.S. The one though that I'm working on now is with the Council of International Schools, which is not U.S. based, Right. um, which is very interesting to go through a different process. I am a WASC uh, visiting team member, so I've done evaluations at other schools. Um, accreditation visits at other schools. Uh, so see, Council of International Schools has been both similar to WASP, but also slightly different in that there's a little bit more um, of a very specific ethical accountability that ha- comes along with that, that isn't present in the WASP protocol um, where they're asking schools to follow under some ethical guidelines, um, some of those coming out of the UN um, and some of those uh, coming from their own um, their own membership, um, you know, profile that they they want their schools to be part of standing for a particular ethical uh, set of statements. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's, that's a different approach, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. So what's your timeline for, for being there in Vietnam and, and rolling that out? Uh, that's a good question. I just arrived here in March. It's, of course, July now that we're speaking. Um, and so... Yeah, there, there's much work to be done. Uh, the process with Council of International Schools is that you you apply and you almost do kind of what I would call a formative assessment process, a formative um, uh, self-study. So it's not your accreditation self-study that you might be familiar with with WASP or any of the other accrediting bodies. It's sort of the, the bar to pass to become members. So we are actually officially members of the Council of International Schools. Um, but we're not accredited with them yet. So that will take another two years from this point. Um, And it involves, we'll do some background work before we hit our our summative self-study, if you will, which will come about a year from now. Fantastic. 
That's really great. I'd love for you to share, we're having a conversation before we started recording about the difference between a doctorate, uh, education doctorate and a PhD or doctor of education. And um, I'm aware that some of our, our leaders and our aspiring leaders in our program are interested in pursuing one of those. Would you mind sharing the difference? Oh, I, I love sharing the difference because I think people get confused about it all the time. I'm often asked if I have a PhD or, or people you know, put my title as PhD. Um, the difference is this, and this is how I explain to my friends and family uh, my degree. Uh, the difference is so, sort of like the difference between, um, I think everybody knows what a medical doctor is, a practitioner of medicine, somebody who can work on patients, and we call them an MD after their title. Um, there, there's someone that knows the practical side of medicine, but you can always, you can also obtain a degree that's a PhD in medicine, and perhaps you're doing research in, you know, cancer research or, or something in a laboratory where you're not necessarily working as a practitioner of medicine, you're working in the philosophical foundations of med medicine and, and trying to shape and, and understand those. Um, and so I would say the same thing about the difference between an, an EDD in education and a PhD in education. The EDD is a practitioner's degree. Um, I work in schools. That is my, my role. I don't necessarily work in academia exclusively. Uh, and a PhD would put me more in an academia setting, an academic setting, um, versus the leadership setting that I have with my EDD. So that's how I like to describe the difference. Thank you for that. That's really interesting too. That'll help people decide what they want to pursue. I noticed on your profile, which is really interesting on LinkedIn, uh, that you were with Upeha, a university here in Indonesia. Tell us about your role there and your experiences. Okay. Um, my role there, actually, a really interesting, um, interesting opportunity for me. I worked as the primary department chair, uh, which means I was over all of the students that were in the teacher education section uh, studying primary or elementary education. Uh, so S day in Indonesian terms. Okay, so all of those teachers were uh, I helped control the uh, the the teaching and learning that happens around that program. So um, several actually several hundred students um, all together in the program. And uh, if you're not familiar, Upeha scholarships actually scholarships those students. Um, from around, from all of the different sukus all around Indonesia, all the different tribal groups around Indonesia, um, brings them uh, brings them into the Upeha campus. Uh, and at Upeha, they learn their their they do their education coursework um, while they're getting free room and board and free tuition. And that is an exchange for them their work later on to repay their scholarship as they work in the system schools that uh, Upeha and Espeha have throughout the country. <clears throat> so we have several different levels of schooling across the country. So um, that's very exciting because you're 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 at that point um, you're mixing a lot of culture in with uh, with educational good education pedagogy. So you're learning a lot about what teachers face uh, in a national um, curriculum, what they face in a, in a, in a classroom with uh, national students. Um, you're learning a lot about, uh, I learned a lot as a, as a docent there about, um, you know, what kinds of things uh, those teachers might struggle with in terms of how to create a classroom atmosphere that, that generates learning. Mm -hmm. So some of my teaching responsibilities were around things like special education, um, and so, as you may know, in Indonesia, special education is one of those fields that is, is not very deeply developed in Indonesia. So often that encompasses mental health, physical health, and intellectual ability, um, all in one sort of big picture piece. And, and we would divide those out much more specifically in a, in a Western context. We would, we would separate those ideas a little bit more. Um, and then, and then, of course, if you know Indonesia well, you understand that mental health and spiritual health are often very closely linked. And so that's, that's very much a challenge um, because there's a lot of influence from Western culture, modern educational thinking about students' well-being. And you cannot separate that idea of spiritual with mental uh, in the Indonesian culture. Those two things don't go together. Uh, it literally is the same words are being used. Uh, to, to indicate both mental health and spiritual health. 
Um, and so, so those things are challenges to work on with teachers. Um, and, you know, what are their concerns about moving places around the country um, and working with students? That's often, you know, the challenges are not the same challenges that I would face in a Western school system where education is um, compulsory, it's mandatory. Um, it's, you know, it's, there's no payment on it, public school system, whereas you're, it's a pay for system in Indonesia and it's not compulsory. And, uh, you know, there are, there, you're of course governed differently in terms of what the local government is and often the conflicts between how the local government executes the orders from, from the national government in Indonesia. So it's, there's a lot of challenges uh, to be met with those, those new teacher trainees, um, but there's also a lot of fun to be met with them as well. They have a lot of great ideas. They have a lot of creativity that they want to share. And yeah, so it was a great time for me. I learned, I learned much more deeply into the, I, I learned much more about the Indonesian culture. I learned uh, much more about myself as an educator as part of it, right? You know, how would I handle some of those situations? Uh, yeah. I think as educators, Brenda, we learn a lot of skills and gain a lot of experiences and capacity that sometimes we don't recognise, but we can travel the world and have a meaningful impact far more than, than we may have if we stayed in our home country. I'd be interested to hear from you about your approach that you took with the students about special needs. Was it a, a mainstreaming type of approach or was it developing special special education units? How did that work? Mm. That's a great question. It was more about educating uh, the students about what different recognized special needs were uh, and are um, so that they would have a little bit more insight into the ideas. Uh, you know, we, we often in the West will talk about things on a, on a spectrum, um, you know, on sort of this, um, this idea that there are, there can be uh, learning, things that inhibit learning from a student's perspective and and or from a student's thinking uh, and how then do we deal with those so um, so when we're talking about it in a, in a very general context like a special education classroom we really want the students to be able to at least have some ability to understand the differences between different um, issues that a student may have so that they can begin to on their own research you know, what are, what are some pedagogies that work with that student? So for example, we'd want you to know that autistic students don't want to be physically touched usually. Um, so it might not be appropriate. You might find that, you know, a student like that uh, doesn't accept your pat on the back or your, or your um, things that you do in the classroom naturally where you may touch a student's shoulder may be bothersome to them. We want our new teachers to to just be on the lookout for those kinds of things so that they can change their practices to help adjust for the individual needs of those students. Um, so, you know, that becomes, that becomes more of a challenge when I start to talk about uh, intellectual disabilities because, again, a lot of that is grouped in with spiritual, um, you know, and, mm. and idea I will, I will never forget as a Western teacher, it really was very difficult for me to have a student ask the question, um, miss, what do I do when a, when a, when a student is possessed um, versus at, at, at that moment I had been talking about mental, mental um, intellectual disabilities, mental retardation, we would sometimes call that, you know, a student that intellectually wasn't reaching, um, wasn't able to reach the curriculum. And this, and this, this student was very much like the other students thinking that, you know, that had more to do with being possessed spiritually um, by an evil, an evil spirit than they were thinking that this is somebody that was incapable of reaching the curriculum. So that was very eye-opening to me, you know, uh, and then how do you address that? You know, you know, how do you address that actual question? Miss, what do I do when my student is possessed, knowing that that is deeply embedded culturally? I mean, you, you, the, Indonesia is a, is a country with, uh, witch doctors do kung still, you know, that, that are our normal part of everyday life. Everyone knows this is, a, this is a part of the cultural understanding. Um, you know, so it's not like I can bring my Western idea where we would separate out the idea of possession. That would be something that we would talk about maybe only in a, in a church context. We wouldn't talk about that in a professional teaching setting. Um, it, it just, it isn't done in the West. So, you know, how do you, navigate those challenges and we 
we talk through that, just that, what I've just said, um, you know, which is that we wouldn't, we wouldn't categorize them that way. And, um, and, and I would, and I would try to steer my students a little bit more towards what would be a professional educational, like how would we assess a student educationally? Um, and that the spiritual side of things would be something that I just was not an expert in and would not be able to help them with. So yeah, it becomes very complex at that point. Mm. I think that's a good lesson for, for us as school leaders and people watching to understand how to gently and respectfully reframe the conversation back to an educational discussion rather than taking on those cultural, the cultural perspective and bring it back to the education process. Yeah. Brenda, because you've had such, um, such a wide experience in different leadership situations, I'd love for you in our few minutes that we have left just to share some perspectives for our aspiring leaders about what are some career tips you might give them experiences that you encourage them to have. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, first of all, I would say I think that, <clears throat> I think that when people are, are moving from a teacher or a teacher leader into um, – into a full-time admin, administrative role or a leadership role in which they are no longer serving under another leader. They're, they're taking on that leadership role for the first time. Um, I think there are some patterns that I see, um, some things that they may struggle with depending on what their background is. In general, if they've come from the teaching field, they've come from the classroom and they want to move into administrative, in administration, um, the, the first mistake, if you will, that I see them making pretty frequently is that they still only have that teaching thought process on their leadership. And when you move from being a teacher in a classroom to being a leader, I, I think you, you cannot afford to only look at it from the teacher's perspective. You have to start mm -hmm. looking at things from a very holistic perspective of the parents, the other leaders in the building, uh, and the students. And I think it's very easy to go from being student-centered, which is what we want teachers to be, uh, to being a student-centered leader that loses sight of the students because they are, are very focused on teaching as a profession, and that's all they've known. And now they have to look beyond the teaching profession and see all of the other factors that go into a school community. Mm. So when I sit at the table sometimes with uh, assistant principals, I, I hear them advocating for the teacher's perspective. Well, that won't work for us because the schedule. That won't work for us because, uh, you know, because it will mean that we, don't, we, we aren't able to take this break or we aren't able to, it will be a lot of work for the teachers or there's a lot of conversation around teacher, teacher, teacher centric. And, and I, what I don't want them to forget is that we, we always have to be student centric. And we have to change our viewpoint or adapt that viewpoint to come from all, all the different uh, stakeholders in a school community. So we've got to be mindful that it doesn't always just come from the teacher's perspective. Um, so that would be, that would be one, one thing that I'd say. The other thing that I would say is that I find that teachers are often um, uh, scared, frightened, you know, personally feel threatened or, or shy or I'm not sure what the right words are. Not confident is probably the best word. Not confident when they have to meet with an angry parent or the parent that's frustrated or with a parent that they know will be confrontational or uh, that they know will be upset about something. And, you know, they often want to know, okay, what's, what, do, what do I say? Like, what, what's your, what's the script? What, tell me what to say to this parent. What's the thing that's going to fix this situation? And, you know, that's where I would encourage, you know, new leaders that they're, they're going to face those situations without a script. There is no right answer to how to handle those things. And I think we're all looking for it. I mean, if I knew it, I would be the world's, you know, most perfect educational leader if I knew exactly what to say in every situation. Um, and I think that people should just know, new leaders should just know that we all struggle with it. Um, just because mm -hmm. I act confident going in the door when there's a, when I know there's a, an angry parent on the other side doesn't mean that I actually am confident. I just have had it happen enough times right. that I know that 
somehow we're going to figure out, we're going to listen a lot and we're going <laughs> to, and we're going to talk a little, but we're going to listen a lot. And, you know, and, and, you know, that's a place to be a little bit humble. It's a, it's a place to not be defensive and it's a place to, to, um, you know, to, to say to yourself, every experience does build that self-confidence and that there, again, that there is no right way. <laughs> that is a very, just like there's no right way with every student, you know, we have to, we still have to, with students, differentiate our curriculum to make sure we're reaching them. We have to really differentiate our approach to parents and it just takes some experience to, to get enough of a sense of what you should do in those situations. So, I, you know, I would advise them instead of running from that conflict, sit in with your administrator if they'll let you sit in with your with other leaders as often as you can to see how they're handling those kinds of situations so that you start to get develop a tool set of ways to approach um, parents when they're not happy. Wow, that's really great advice. Thank you. That's something that no one has mentioned before for aspiring leaders is about going into those difficult situations, understanding we all have to go through it and just go through it. That's really good. Thank you. Brenda, I really want to thank you for your time. I know it's a challenging time right now. You're in a different time zone, but you've made time for us to learn from your experiences. So thank you very much. And we wish you all the best with your time in Vietnam, however long that is. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.